morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. Whatever side of the diaspora that you're on, welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope your holidays were wonderful. Hope you uh, got everything that you asked Santa for. And um, that, or if you spent the holiday alone, that that too was uh, beneficial to you and not too depressing, okay? So with that being said, you know, I'm always liking to talk about the narcissism. I know a lot of y'all don't want to hear it because a lot of y'all are in, you know, cognitive, you have cognitive dissonance around how we got here. And I can understand that, especially if I was in the control group. Um, so I try to make these conversations where they make sense, where I'm not trying to coddle to your fragility. In fact, there's a book called White Fragility. And I would hope that every white person under the sound of my voice would get it. And it's written by what is that? Is that Jack or no? That's Robin D'Angelo. Um, I think she's out of Seattle, Washington. She's a sociologist, but I think her book uh, is a very, very well-written um, synopsis of pretty much what white fragility looks like, what it is, and straight out of the mouth of a white person. So I really appreciate her wherever she is today on the planet. I want to thank God for you for writing that book. And um, it was truly a labor of love. Okay, that's number one. Um, so when I look at how we got here, and I try to tell y'all things like, uh, I try to share with you, I should say, that the after 16, what is it? 71 is when the narcs took over the country. Oh, spirit, you know, uh, sparingly they were setting up, you know, shop and little rules, but because they weren't as dominant and their way of, they hadn't, you know how most of them have a lust, a crazy lust for power. So they hadn't actually dominated to the point yet where I think it was even the, um, it wasn't the revolution yet. So we have to think about in 1691, you had black people and white people actually cohabitating together. You had indentured servants. You had free black people. You had white people who were, um, you know, indentured servants for 30 years. You had black people who could, if they were indentured servants as well, they could buy their freedom. Um, but the landscape looked a lot, of, lot different than what it turned to. Uh, they begin to create laws. And I think one of the first laws that um, they created was um, no black person could testify against a white person in court. And I'm assuming that black people that were free at that time must have been freaking out. They must have been like, what? What, what you really mean? I mean, because you know the Moors were helped a lot of the... A lot of these these generation of Europeans put clothes on and had stopped them from sleeping with animals and everything else. And they civil, basically civilized them to a degree. Taught them how to take baths because they didn't do those things. Um, they said women took baths maybe once a year. And I shudder to think. Um, well, just read the story, the, the, the history of the petticoat, and you'll get it. But anyway, um, I can imagine... Uh, the black people uh, the sentence, uh, the, at that time they were pretty much shocked to find out that now that they couldn't even testify against someone that, that was just an, a person that committed a transgression against them. So that must have been mind boggling. Um, it goes on to say you know how this 1% just like today these narcissists, this 1% was doing things that the majority of white folks were saying, ooh, damn, what you doing? You know, stuff like slitting 
black women's stomach opens and taking the fetus, the baby out of the stomach and bashing his head on the ground. Those things not only traumatize black people, but they traumatize white psychic as well. Okay. Um, there was a class where someone asked, do you think that in the amygdala that you, that some of these behaviors would hate? Do you think that they are just so re, um, gurgitated in the mind, rekindled in the mind that can, you know, can it ever, can you be taught? Can you grow with that, this, this spirit of hatred for a black person? And my answer is yes. I, I, I think very clearly um, because of the traumatic experience that white people had to witness and not only um, have to feel enormous guilt about, um, especially ones that know they wouldn't do anything like that. They shudder to think what their ancestors did. A lot of them apologize in behalf on behalf of their ancestors. I've had white people uh, apologize to me personally, uh, whether I was doing a speech or whether I was speaking or saying anything or just giving talk or for slavery. You know, and I know what, what we, where we want to hear it as black people is from the higher up, but of course they won't do it because they can't deal with Again, here we go with that cognitive dissonance. They couldn't deal with what comes behind once you admit guilt because you know some retribution is involved. And the, the point I'm trying to make is without even talking about that aspect of it, the fact that the trauma has disturbed white people as well as black people. It has made white people have a paranoia for black people so much that I think that white people's hatred for black people is at a extreme high. I think they hate black people more than any other uh, other immigrants, any of the uh, people of color. Um, they don't have a chance when it comes to hate for black people. So anything you got, you put a little color on it, it becomes worse. And if you put black on it, descending a slave on it. It becomes unbearable. And my contention is it's their shame. It's their guilt that they hate us so bad because they just feel that we're going to retaliate at some point. And we've done it. There's been insurrections all through time when people people knowing that we were enslaved. I mean, we revolted. We always did. Um, some revolts were more successful than others. But none of us stopped. Jim Crow, I mean, none of those revolts stopped Jim Crow, black codes, uh, you know, reconstruction, none, none of that. But at the same time, I think white folks have a cognitive dissonance that they don't really want to dissonance, that they don't want to hear it because it's too painful. As a human being, if I felt that my clan was on the other end of the hideous uh, craziness that I, that you know that you perpetrated, I probably would feel the same way. But I also know if I want to heal and get to the bottom of the, the narcissism and the healing of the world, then I have to deal with the pain. And so as a white person, I would just have to deal with it. I would have to deal with the pain. And there's nothing I could talk about. I couldn't tell no good uh, black stories about how I grew up and I knew one black girl and I saved her from none of those things are valid in anybody's mind unless you want to deal with collectively how we got here in this mislabeled mythical construct called white because you are not who you think you are there was a law that allowed you to be who you are that was set up to divide and conquer the populations and to just wreak greed. That's what the white people race was created for. By that 1% elite. And they figured that if they could figure out a way also 
even though they couldn't stand the, the, the poor white trash, but if they could figure out a way to make them identify with them because of their color, then they knew that they could get them to mistreat uh, the blacks, even though the poor white and the, indent I mean, the indentured slave and the poor and the slave had the same thing in common. They were being exploited by the 1%. But of course, man's inhumanity to man then and now wouldn't even allow them to see that. So, you know, it's uh, just, it's a pretty interesting read when you read that book, White Fragility. And um, I'm reading that and I'm, put, I'm putting that in coupling with Nat Turner. I mean, not Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey. Um, his, and when you put these books up around this, you know, uh, and put them in context, it's really interesting to how we got here. So, again, white supremacy has hurt white folks as well as it's hurt black people. White people are in such cognitive dissonance that they, they would rather say, oh, you know, racism and means the Ku Klux Klan and the skinhead, and I'm not like that, so I'm not a perpetrator or a condoner of racism. But they don't understand or they refuse to understand because they can't stand in the conversation long enough to know that it's an institution. And it's a, it's a it's prejudice backed up by the institutions that you guys have created to keep my people in bondage. And I consider them your flying monkeys, basically. The judicial system, all those things that are in place, the police department, the unfair housing, all this stuff, the ghettos, keeping black people in one particular area, making um, the black and white issue exploited even more. Because most people left to their own devices and you, you leave the government and it's sanctioned racism out of things. If you leave people at their own devices, they usually figure out a way to get it together unless they are mentally ill. Because most people are not that crazy. Most people mind their own business. And unless they get that, uh, unless they're brainwashed, again, and it's kind of hard not to be if you're not one of the persons that, that want to be part of the solution. If you're not part of the solution, then I know you're part of the problem. So if you're not one of these people like Jacqueline Battalore or Jay Elliott, I know a lot of y'all got problems with them, but I thank God for them. Tim Weiss, um, you know, uh, Robin, uh, D'Angelo, um, all of them. Anybody out there that I'm missing, you too. Because what I understand is the more information and the more education that people have about how we got right here and that you can see that the country was built on a form of narcissism. Racism is narcissism. It's madness. If you... Um, understand the dynamic of narcissism, you'll see you have the scapegoats, you see you have the golden child, which is the white people, you have the, it is amazing, you have the mascots and everybody all in between, and unless you can see our very existence like that, then you'll never be able to see the truth behind the situation, you'll keep thinking you're better than somebody, when all in reality, you know good and well that you're not, you know that you're not. But what you do is you have this cognitive dissonance. You can't get out of the fog because you would have to deal with a reality that is so ugly and brutal that you have to take responsibility and even look at. And even if you want to dismiss it as you didn't do it, you know it's, it's, it was perpetuated by people that look like you. And you bear some responsibility. It's called sins of the father. And you have benefited from a system that has allowed you to take advantage of other people. Rape, rob, castrate, you know, burn. And that's that's not good for anybody to think that they did it to anybody, black or white. So I get it. But I just wanted to come on here quickly and again give y'all a couple of books that I thought were very interesting reads. I love them. One was when we, became, when we Became White by Jacqueline Battalore and Battalora. 
and the other one was White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo. And I would hope that you guys could pick up that book, um, those books, I'm sorry, read them. Uh, and also, well, those, those, those will hold you pretty good right there because you, it'll, it'll take you to a whole different dynamic of thought. Okay, and that's black or white, red or yellow, doesn't matter. All right. So with that being said, I am going to allow to let you go. Say uh, again, happy holidays to you. You know we got New Year's coming up right around the corner. So um, I know I'll be back before then. <laughs> but in the meantime, if you like what you hear, please like, please subscribe, please share. And I'm going to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.